Hello, welcome to the High Business Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Martinez. Today I have special co-host, Kyle Thompson, with me. And I have a special guest, Mr. Darcy Marler. Now, Darcy Marler has been a real estate investor for over 20 years. And uh, we're going to have a good conversation that I'm excited about today. Hope you all stay tuned. So, Darcy, what part of the country are you from today? Actually, I'm in Canada, actually. So, uh, Calgary, Canada. Canada. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We've had a few Canadians on the podcast. Have you always been in Canada or did you invest in the United States at all? I've done the U.S. as well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've had a few Canadians on the show. Is it, do you like, and this is a preference, but do you prefer investing in Canada or United States? It's a lot better now to do it in the United States, especially what I'm doing with the development, the new construction. Uh, the permitting part is just way, way shorter in the U.S. and uh, you can get things done a little quicker. That's what I tell people. Yeah. Now, this is a good question for you. So, you have you? When did you start investing in the U.S. And when is was there like a pivot point where some law came about or something that made you like, oh, I should invest in the U.S. now? <laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, it's been recent the, the last few years. The uh, so I'm in in the province of Alberta, which okay. is uh, in the west, north of Montana. It's kind of like Texas. We're conservative and oil and gas and cowboys and all that. So but we're, <laughs> because of the oil and gas, we're prone to these booms and busts and booms and busts. So I've done development of about nine different jurisdictions, but I just got tired of that, right? So I want to invest in, in places that are you know, just a little more, given my gray hair, I want things to be a little more even keel and consistent and uh, not too much excitement. So yeah, so places like Houston or Texas and, and Florida are great places to, to be for that. Amazing. What type of development are you doing in the States right now? So a couple of things. So uh, I'm doing some new construction in Florida. And then also I've, I just did a money raise uh, in uh, to do some raw land development in uh, just in Houston, in Houston or Dallas. I'm still trying to find the piece of dirt. But yeah, I raised about a million too. And I'm looking to to buy whatever that'll buy me, 20 acres, let's say, and develop some, some raw lots and, and then sell those to builders and let them build out the homes. What part of Florida are you investing in? More the uh, the Gulf side, so in that Fort Myers, Cape Coral, St. Okay, Petersburg okay. area along the, the Gulf Coast there. Nice. Yeah, that's a great area right now. I'm in yeah. Orlando. I'm in Orlando. Okay. The area is booming right now for land. The high acres and Fort Myers, Cape Coral, that whole area is just yeah. a lot of infill lots, and we've sold some infill lots there too. I think, you know, there's migration all over the states, you know, Typically from kind of the higher tax, higher bureaucracy kind of areas to the lower tax. So from the Californias, the New, York, New Yorks, the Chicago's down south. But even within like a Florida, like for me personally, the, the Atlantic side, the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, that's just too crazy, too stressful, yeah. too much driving. I personally like the, the more laid back atmosphere of the Gulf and, and even into Orlando. So I think you're seeing movement even between, in, in between states. I 100% agree. But let's talk about... Investing in Canada, oh, 23 years is a long time. I yeah. think uh, that's a, it's a lot of experience. Were you always doing development or did you start off in single family and doing other stuff first? Or what was like your kind of journey? into? No. Nope. So I was, uh, I used to be a computer guy years ago. I don't know why that's, that's a very common theme in real estate investing. Everybody comes from IT. Anyway, so from the late nineties into the two thousands, I actually was uh, living and working full time in South America, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil. Loved it. My wife down there. Kids were born there. Got burnt out. Didn't want to see another computer. So I came back and I'd always been interested in, in real estate. So, you know, pretty much all they teach is flips and rentals and new and, uh, and uh, Airbnb now. But back in the day, it was just flips and rentals. So, okay, I guess I'll do some flips. And, and I started to do that. And a couple of those didn't sell. Okay, so now I guess I'm a landlord. And, uh, and that started the journey. But I've done pretty much everything. Flips, you know, long and short term. Uh, rentals, flip spurs, condo conversions, new construction, land development. So I, you know, I get bored easy. So I was flipping around doing all this kind of stuff. And again, like I said, you just get tired of the, the booms and busts and say, no, I just, I just want to get off the roller coaster and, and make a video. <laughs> so one thing I really want to hit on, I think it's funny because I, me and me and Kyle, we're, we're both land guys. We do a lot of land stuff, but yes. why land? After everything you've done, why land? Because a lot of people. They, they don't understand land, and I think you kind of understand land a little bit here. So why, after doing everything, you end up doing land land development? So let me say why I don't like some of the other stuff, I guess. So I've had 
you know, close to a thousand tenants, 240 doors in my day. So I, I just never enjoyed the rental part. Never liked the tenants and the toilets, the fixing up old crop. Never liked the eight or 10 year. I got to hold this thing with a JV partner for that long before I get the appreciation. So basically nothing really about that whole world I enjoy. On the project side, the flips, the condo conversions, that I was my own on-site supervisor. So you're down at the site every day. Again, you're fixing up old crop. You're at Home Depot every day for 18 years. You just get bored and tired. So it attracts me to the new construction, land development, land parceling, you know, some of the entitlement strategies that we'll talk about here. It's new. You get to do with new buildings and, and you get to be creative and you get to, you know, literally watch your, you know, whether it's horizontal, you get to see the the dirt get moved around and, and, and trenches being built and pipe being put in the ground and then you're building the roads if you're going vertical you get to see the house or the, the fourplex or whatever you're building coming out of the ground so the sense of pride is just you can't compare it you know you're sitting back at the end and you're watching this fourplex that you just built versus renovating a you know 1950s piece of crap like the sense <laughs> of pride is just way way different so i, I that's kind of what i'm addicted to is the, is that you know i've done some subdivisions and you know, you drive through that even today, and just the sense of pride. You know, this exists on this planet because because I did that. That that's that's a pretty cool feeling. People have housing because of me. Like that's that's cool. great. Absolutely, uh, that's, you know, we resonate with that a lot. We resonate with that a lot. Plus, you know, I grew up on a farm, so maybe you know, I like the smell of dirt. I don't. know. Maybe that's part of it too. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think the coolest thing is that you have a clean. Let's say artist. There's a clean slate yes. canvas that you get to create and mold something that's going to be there for a long time. It might change in the future. Who knows? But at least it'll be there for probably 30 to 40 years. And at least you kind of molded that future. But, it, you know, so even if I'm doing the burst strategy or, or, or flips or whatever, you know, I've got this 1950s, you know, it's a thousand square feet, you know, seven and a half foot ceilings. Bedrooms are nine by nine. You know, I can't, you know, maybe I knock out a wall to, you know, they used to have the kitchen and the, and the living room separate. I knock out the wall. Now it's one big room, but, you know, even if I get the latest cabinetry and flooring and lighting fixtures, it's still it's still dated, like you said. So it's it's not a clean slate. You're you're working with the existing limitations of that building. Here, everything's brand new, clean slate, clean clean canvas, and you can you, you can really you know if you want nine foot ceilings on both the main floor and the second floor, go nuts, do what you whatever you want. Yeah, that's pretty. It's, it's definitely interesting. How are you securing financing for these projects? And like, what, what type of project steel size are you looking for? So I did the, like, so let's say Houston, for example. So I did the money raise first. And that's becoming more and more, I think that's going to be more and more of a bigger thing. A lot of times now you'll go, if you don't have the money, for example, you, you know, you, you find the property is kind of the traditional way of doing it. But more and more now the seller or the seller's realtor is going, okay, do you have proof of funds? You got some money? You're going to waste my client's time for the next three or four months while you go and frantically raise money. So I did the money raise first. And so now that kind of limits you. Uh, it doesn't necessarily limit you, but it limits you on, on the size of the project, right? So, you know, let's say on north part of, of Houston, acreages cost, you know, 200, 250,000 an acre. Well, I'm going to be able to buy so much land. Someplace else where it's 50,000 an acre, I can buy more. Over here, it's, you know, it's 20 to 30,000 an acre, I can buy more, right? If I go more into the inner city, maybe I can only afford a couple of acres and then do apartment buildings. So, you know, there's kind of pros and cons in against everything. Uh, if if you find in the land first, then you got to raise the money. If you raise the money first, then you you know you, you might be looking at different sizes, scope, and you got to be flexible on the amount of land. But the other thing, as far as financing goes, too, is what's great about this world, the development world, is that because of the housing crisis, um, there's government incentives, uh, rebates, you know, helping the financing uh, with that, so that you know, and uh, you've got a lot more options for for that in this development world as compared to flips and rentals because we're adding we're adding units and and helping like i said the housing crisis so there's a lot more options in the financing in this world i feel how are how are you finding those financing options that are maybe state or local wide is there like a tip or trick to that yeah so typically you know at all three levels you've got the the municipal level the, the state level and then the federal level there, there's different uh uh, different things available. Like I said, it could be a tax rebate, an incentive program. Maybe it's instead of the financing being traditionally 75% loan to cost for the construction loan, maybe you can get up into the 85 or 90, so a lot less cash required. But, you know, just kind of you're looking in 
uh, you know, doing Google searches at the municipal or state or federal level, depending what you're trying to do. Uh, specifically, if you're doing multifamily, like kind of over five units, if you're building apartment buildings, whatever, there's there's quite a bit available there because yeah, the government's trying to incentivize in certain places that we're building more more units. You know, we're, that thing I talk about too is is uh, you know, typically we think of land development as just outside, you know, the outskirts of town, urban sprawl, we're just growing and growing out there, big companies, you know, building a thousand track homes. I kind of bring it down to a to kind of normal size investors level. Well, let's just start with an old house on a you know a fifty foot lot. What can we do with that? Well, we can tear down the house and build a a fourplex or a sixplex. More in the inner city, we can help re, re, revitalize neighborhoods, kind of normalize neighborhoods like that. So again, the the, the government's right into that too. They, they like to see that. There's always ability, you know, to if you're if you're building kind of for the lower income crowd or for seniors. There's there's lots of information and stuff. There's again incentives to do that. Interesting. How are you managing like boots on the ground? Because you do you come to the states often, or do you have contractors you work with that locally in different areas? Or yeah, so I'll answer that a couple of ways. So one of the things, like I said, I was on site supervisor all the time doing my own stuff, and you get mm-hmm. bored of it, right? And then you realize, you know, you don't have to be a lone wolf. You can you can delegate some of this stuff, right? Absolutely. So Houston, I've been down Houston like five times in the last couple of years. A you know getting a lay of the land. Uh, building the team, you know, figuring out what's what's different about it, and, and there's a little bit different. You know, I knew I knew Houston fairly well. Like I said, I was in the in South America in the late '90s. My client was a U.S. based uh, multinational oil company out of Houston, so I traveled to Houston quite a bit, so I know it quite well. But you know, you just gotta get up to speed with what's new. So basically, you know, you're building your team, you're, you're learning which sides, which parts of the city are best for for what. You know, there's kind of a different. Houston's kind of unique in that. Up north, north of the city in the Woodlands, Con- Woodlands Conroe, it's very you know very wet, very lush. You know some really great trees there. If you go west into the Katy area, it's really dry, right? So again, you've got some different things you got to learn about. There's uh, you know some flood issues there. You know you might find a beautiful piece of dirt, but you look up the you know a flood map, and in the hundred year storm, you're going to lose eighty percent of the of the of the lot. So these are kind of some of the things you got to worry about uh, when you when you're looking for land. There. Do you prefer uh, one market over the other? Do you prefer Texas over Florida, or is it just doesn't really matter to you? I prefer, again, one of the things that I'm used to, like I said, the up and downs, but the other thing is it does take longer to get permits. So uh, I've got Darcyisms, and one of them is in and out quick. So if I can get a permit, uh, you know, in, in three to five weeks versus, you know, 10 months, I like that a lot. So I like. I like the South because hey, that's where people are moving to. So, you know, you get the demographics that, that uh, will, will back up adding new units. You've got a lower uh, dependable workforce, the lower cost workforce. You've got a lot less bureaucracy, a lot less fees and permits, a lot less time to do it. So it's kind of the, the overall, uh, a, the government involvement is it as small as possible. And then, you know, are people moving there? You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to start and build 10 units in a, in a town where they're, you know, boarding up Main Street kind of thing, right? Yeah. So the demographics have to have to go with it as well. Exactly, exactly. So in in the case of Florida and Texas, because we we've only done, um, you know, some bigger projects entitlements in, in Texas. What's the difference there between the timelines that you're working with in Florida as opposed to Texas? If you're looking at like apples to apples on a deal, like maybe like um, some sort of entitlement deal that is very similar to Texas and Florida, but timeline wise. Yeah. So the time, well, again, even within the Texas, like you've got a uh, San Antonio, which is longer, you know, they call uh, San Antonio blue city in a red state kind of thing. Right. So again, you, you, you kind of even within this, I can't even globally say Texas is, is perfect all over it. Um, but that's part of, you know, all strategies and I've done everything, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. Right. Rentals, you got tenants, and like I said, you need your ten years to get it done. Flips, you're always on the hunt. You know, I always there's a lot of pressure to for me to find the next one to keep my my, my team busy. Kind of the downside of the development world is you got to spend some time up front. You know, learning what's different. You know, um, you know we're taught all we know. Most of us is flips and rentals. So, you know, what is zoning and density? What is highest and best use? How do you increase the value of land? But another thing is geographically, where are we going to be? Because it is such a you know I can. This this place will take you know three months to approve my zoning change. This place takes two years, right? And everything in between. So 
we're investors. We want to kind of get in and out quick. So let's not right. let's play in the two year place. Let's play yeah. more in the three, four month place. So that's yeah. part of Time the build building part's actually pretty easy, right? Like yeah. lots of people know how to build stuff. So it's more the, let's take some time, think like investors, let's, you know, learn what we got to learn. Let's figure out where we're going to do it. Start to, you know, start to analyze that, put the deal together, put the funding together. But then our team's doing all the back and forth with the city, getting our permits. So it's actually a pretty good return on time. We can just sit back and think like investors and and at the point where we're ready to, to go, our team will kind of take over. So you keep uh, talking about your team. It sounds like you, you built out a pretty good team. Is it so you're using like agents for boots on the ground? Or I know Daniel kind of touched on it a little bit. Who are you using for your main boots on the ground? Like who's like, if you needed someone to go walk something for you, like who, who's the first person you're going to call? So, um, no, good question. So basically we got some new players as opposed to the flip and rental world. So a realtor is more involved here. Uh, mm -hmm. A realtor is kind of comes in three places. One is they'll help you find the initial land or the original old house to knock down. They can help with the, the, the filling out of the, you know, the back of napkin pro forma, you know, what is my, you know, end sale going to be, or if I'm going to build it and keep it in my rental portfolio, you know, what, what can, uh, the rents be when I finish building this stuff. And then finally at the end, you know, they'll help you sell it as well. So a realtor kind of takes on a more, yeah. a different road there. We've, we're, we're dealing with surveyors, civil engineers. If we're doing the vert or the horizontal, we're civil engineers, planners. If we're going vertical, then we're into architects or architectural right. technology. So we've got some new players. And so, yeah, so when, when I'm down there, depending on what I do, right? So if once you get to the point, let's say I'm going vertical on a building, a, you know, fourplex or something, you put the, you know, you get the stage where everything's approved and you got your final blueprints, you put it out for tender and you get some bids and you go with, you know, a final builder. Okay. And so now they're, you're, they're boots on the ground. You have regular talks with them a couple of times a week. You know, another couple of tips, you know, with technology now, you can stick a camera on a post in the, in the corner and, and just hook it up to the internet. So you can kind of keep an eye, a watch all, all the time on, you know, did any work get done today or not? Yeah. And then, Thing, you know, you, it's, I've done this in the past too, where you just hired a local inspector and just paid him a couple hundred bucks a week, no reports or anything, just walk around the site and yeah, was doing good or no, you know, the, the blocking wasn't too great. So I talked to your foreman about that and, right. and uh, so you can kind of get it around that way. But, you know, you still want to make kind of regular trips, but uh, you can do a lot of this stuff uh, right. far away now. Absolutely. So are you doing more of, as we call ourselves, almost like paper pushes where we, we're not trying to do a lot of the vertical work? Are you doing a lot more vertical work at this point or are you kind of trying to shy away from it? I personally like that. I, I think there's three stages to development. There's kind of the paperwork only, entitlement, paper lot, strategy, whatever you call it, where you're just changing zoning or density and selling it or you're maybe potentially getting your architect to design that fourplex get the building permits approved and now you got a shovel ready package, you know, lot assembly where you knock on the neighbor's door, maybe now instead of just a 50 foot lot, now you got two fifties, you got a hundred. What do you do with that? You know, so there's that kind of paperworky stuff. Mm -hmm. There's lot prep where you're actually, you know, whether it's 20 acres on the outskirts of town or an old, uh, just a regular lot in the inner city, you know, out with the old in with the new, I can't, what you gotta get rid of maybe the old house, rickety old fence, the driveway, whatever, you know, maybe some, some ground clearance if you're, if you're bigger. So there's kind of the, the Latin prep where you're actually creating service lots to sell to a builder. And then the third part is I'm actually going to build something again, right. no quick. So I like the, I like typically if you're doing a big project, I say, don't do all three, pick a lane. Uh, right. Cause it just, it's a long time. You know, if you're, if you're doing that, then it can be a, you know, three, four, five year project, phase project, stuff happens, economies change, interest rates change, governments change. So in and out quick is a big thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but again, you can match it to your strategy, your personality. Like, what do you want? Like, maybe you just want paperwork and perfect. In and out, four or five months, make a profit, boom. Right. Or you like dirt, you like the smell of dirt, let's put some, let's build a subdivision. So there's, the great thing about development is there's all these entry and exit points. You don't have to finish, right? So you can just pick a lane that, that you like and, uh, yeah. and stick with it and, and uh, enjoy it more. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Are you doing anything vertical right now? What is What does that look like? I'm just starting to, yeah. Uh, so again, talking to a few builders, but yeah, more on, like I said, the Gulf side of Florida, uh, in and out quick. You know, you can typically, because of the housing crisis, I, I talk a lot about let's come back with higher density and, and, uh, and that, but 
you know, the ability to buy a vacant lot and build a house in 10 months and, you know, make a pretty good return in 10 months with the builder doing all the work. That that's, uh, looks pretty good too, right? So I don't mind that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Darcyisms. Can you mention, can you mention a few of your favorite Darcyisms? Yeah. So I feel uh, like yeah, the, the, the wisdom is a uh, experience over yeah. time. So in and out quick, you know, like I said, governments change, interest rates change, costs change. So the, you know, you're typically better off in and out quick. Uh, don't paddle upstream. By that, I mean, don't fight City Hall. If you've heard horror stories about development, it's, it's usually because the developer tried to do something they knew they weren't going to be allowed to do. So uh, let me give you an example. So let's say I'm just dead set on building a 24 unit apartment building, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to be flexible on where I do that. I either have to go where it's already zoned and allowed, or I have a reasonable expectation of having that approved if I, if I apply for approval. If I'm dead set on, on developing in this neighborhood, in this community, well, then I have to be flexible on what I do because only certain things are going to be allowed. There's a range, every community, every neighborhood, every city has a range of what you can build in each place, right? And, you know, it's kind of a square peg round hole. If you're butting heads, no damn it, I want the 24 unit apartment building here and they're only allowing duplexes and fourplexes, you know, you're in for a rough go. So it's kind of like don't fight city hall, you know? And then, yeah, and then um, in and out or out with the old in with the new is the other one, right? So, What's there existing now that I need to get rid of? Again, old house, driveway, garage, rickety fence in the back, some trees. And then in with the new, what is the builder going to need from me as the developer? You know, maybe it's an old house. So, you know, the size of the water line coming in was really small, but now I'm going to have an eightplex there. Okay, a lot more water use. I'm going to have to upsize the, the water line. So with the old in with the, the new works and it works on every size of project. You know, I built a a horse track and a casino. The, the process is the same. What's there that I have to get rid of, and what do I have to, to put in and to, to make the new the new dream work? So there's three right there. Three dark seasons. <laughs> let's let's talk about the horse track. Is that in Canada? Getting a horse track done? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of twenty years ago now, a, a group of horse owners, you know, kind of high net worth people, wanted to build a new track in, in my town of Calgary. The the old track was like eighty years old. And, didn't really work anymore. So, you know, we're in a great economy. Life is good. They got partway down the, the road and then the, the 08 recession hit. And so now basically they're $108 million in debt. They've got the, the foundations in and, and that's about it. So they brought me in to kind of to repicture that, kind of turn that around. And so I was able to, uh, we, we actually based uh we're in the Canadian equivalent of, of chapter 13, where we kind of were just frozen and the courts froze our creditors and we were allowed time to kind of work out a, a deal to kind of get out. So I, I got us from 108 million in debt down to about 30. I partnered with a company out of Austria that was on the, uh, the NASDAQ, uh, Century Gaming out of, out of Austria. So they kind of brought in the new money. We, we, I sold the land, I sold all the land and then leased it back as a way to raise some money. So by doing these kind of creative things, we're able to, to kind of get out of creditor protection or chapter 13 and, and actually go ahead and, and build this track. That was from 2009. It took, us, took me six years till 2015 until we were actually running. But we're nine years in now and horses are running around the track and people are putting dollar bills into or dollars into the slot machine. So it's actually a pretty cool story. Wow. Wow. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a lot of ingenuity to make that happen yeah. because even reaching out to the another country's gaming yeah. <laughs> to raise money. That's smart. But that's cool. That's the cool thing about development too, right? Is it can be small, just one house, knock it down, build a duplex. It can be massive, right? So that's another thing about development that I love is, is you really get to use your, uh, your brain and be creative and, and do lots of different things. So you talk about creative, how often you're using like creative finance, um, you know, you just talked about leasing back the property and we, we, Daniel and I, we love creative finance. How often are you using it? Quite a bit. Like, you know, one of the things uh, I, I kind of talk about a lot is uh, can you partner with the seller? And I, yeah. I, I teach about 11 or 12 different ways to do that. Different in the flip and, or flip and rental world, I need the seller to leave because I got to renovate yeah. the rents, right? Yeah. They can't say, so, you know, you got agreement for sale, VTB, you're kind of limited. Here, ideally, if I can partner with the seller so that I can, you know, 
everybody says, oh, Darius, you know, everything here is 800, you know, it's 800,000 for that little crappy knockdown house in where I live, right? So it doesn't work. Well, if you can partner with a seller, you don't have to buy the property, right? Let them live there while you're getting your permits, cutting the grass, paying the insurance and all that. Now your cost, you know, your money is only needed for permits and fees and some engineering to get whatever permits you're going for. So it's a great way to kind of resume, save cash and, and use a lot less cash. Um, at the end, you've got the permits you want. Now, maybe you sell it to a builder and, you know, you, you pay the, the seller the amount you've agreed on plus some kind of split or, you know, whatever terms you've, you know, some kind of bonus for, for playing with you. Or maybe you do want to go do the horizontal and the vertical. So now you've, you've worked out an exit strategy where you can pay the original, the original seller. So they get, you know, they get a little bit of a bonus for working with you over those few months or whatever. So what? It's a really, really cool way to to really expand your options. You know, we're always talking about we got to have JV money partners. Well, if you can partner with the the seller, that saves you having you know a need for a ton of money. So it, it really, really helps a lot being creative like that. That that's one thing that gravitated us towards this game too. Is uh, is again, you could just be so much more creative. You have a lot more options to do, um, and it's just it's a lot of times it's just dirt. Like it's, it's there's no there's not as much emotion involved. So it's just a lot easier to get some creative terms going. Just let me tell you a real quick story. So uh, a student of mine out of Seattle, actually it was his hometown is, is uh, Charleston, South Carolina. He was stuck working in, in uh, Seattle, making good money, New, uh, newly run, or newly wed. So pressure from the home front to quit the job and come back home. He'd done some um, wholesaling, didn't like it, really negative, lots of negative feedback from those flyers that come out. So he, so he, saw, my, he saw me in, and this is what I want to do, right? So quit his job, moved back because he's got three projects on the go and just one real quick. So he found some land that right now is zoned for like, you know, two houses. An older couple that, that uh, had hoped that their son would end up building there. Uh, he didn't want it. They know that they can sell it and, and build, but the new houses that would go in, the two new houses would be like 900,000 or a million. And she's a retired nurse. And she said, well, you know, I would never be able to live there. So I want more this to be more affordable. So my student came to her and said, yeah, then we can do that, but I need time, right? So give me six months to uh, to see if I can get the zoning to build 10 or 14 townhouses, and then there'll be a lot more uh, a lot more need for that, like lower income housing, right? Mm -hmm. And so she loved that, so that's what they're doing. So the, the, to buy the land was 195000 To get, you know, just to kind of a little, the next level up, up zoning or entitlement is like 20 grand of, of fees. Yep. Um, if you had 120, you could actually rezone it and do the whole full 14, right? So he said, well, I got the 195, Dars, but I don't have the 120. I can do either or. I said, well, once you're a little bit further along, once you're confident that you're going to be able to, to get the exit that you that you want and that the city's on board with this, why don't you go back to the, 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 the older couple? Because they want it. Like, they want to work with you. They've proven that and say, hey, why don't we rip up the old contract and instead of 195, what if I pay you like 230 or 250? I'll pay you 50,000 non-refundable now, but then the rest won't come until till the end, till the final exit. So that saves, you know, you've got the 195. Well, now you've got 50 out of pocket. Now you've got the 120 where you can actually do the full entitlement, do the full shovel ready package and get the much higher return, the much higher profit. Mm -hmm. Right. Kind of a light bulb moment for us. Yeah, I can do that. But again, just being creative, figuring this out. And again, like, so he can sell it, he can flip it for 25 grand tomorrow. If he does just kind of the little bump, there's about 100 grand worth of profit in there. If he goes yep. the full way, gets a shovel ready, there's probably about 300 grand, 350 thousand dollars profit for him if he can if he can do the full thing. So that's kind of some of the numbers that are involved sometimes. I, I like I like the, the our whole strategy, and this is why I like bigger stuff. Is I don't even negotiate on price. If anything, I want to get them their price and then some. And that's really how I play that angle. Yeah. So the a lot, a lot of smaller uh, other asset classes you have to beat people up on price because you can't you can't make money any other way you have to beat people up on prices with development you kind of have a blank canvas to create value at x and whatever x is does it prices doesn't matter price is relevant terms are more important here i think than in a lot of the other situations like this gentleman here like my, my student like he hated wholesaling because he's sending out these flyers to the neighborhood 
not hearing back from anybody he wants, but he's hearing all these nasty emails and phone calls. You SOB yeah. kind of thing. Because, it, you know, I'm, I'm, the flyer says, you know, I'll buy your land 30 cents on the dollar, right? Well, yeah. this is just a total nicer vibe. You're going there, you're sitting down with a couple. If I can hit your, your you know, your fair market value, it's price or term. Right? There's that old maxim, you can have price or terms, but not both. I'll meet your price, but I need six months, 10 months, whatever. And here's what that looks like. And then we can either share some of the profits or, you know, as a go further along, I can make payments in in, in stages because I'm more comfortable that the end uh, exit is what I want it to be, right? So there's a lot more, it's, it's more positive. You get to, you know, this this lady, she wanted retired nurse, she wanted some more affordable housing. So she, my, my, my student says she was actually crying. She was so happy that uh, they'd worked out this deal, right? So, I mean, it's, it's just a whole different vibe than kind of the traditional wholesaling. So you mentioned earlier about the 11 ways to get creative financing. Can you kind of cover some of those ways? Yeah, so we, we've touched on a few of them. So yeah, how do you partner with the seller? So, you know, can you pay a, you know, a, you work out kind of a split at the end? So, you yep. know, I'm going to take it to here. Here's the, the exit for me, whether it's just entitlement or whether we're going to go a little further. Um, you know, so there's maybe some kind of split. I've seen people kind of rent. I'll, I'll rent your house for, you know, the six or 10 months that you're going to still live there and you're still going to cut the grass and you're doing everything. But, you know, so basically it's just ways to, 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 you know, find so that you don't have to kind of make the big bowl, you know, typically, you know, people just, I'm going to buy your house 30 day close, 45 day close. Boom. Yep. You know, I got to arrange financing. Is there a way to work with the seller so that, you know, okay, I'll, you've matched my price and then here's, you know, what how can i incentivize you to work with me for six or ten months you know what does that look like all kinds of you know different ways to do that maybe you know i really you know i really loved living here you know i, I don't really want to move but whatever okay well how about we're going to build these townhouses and how about you get one at the end you know something like that right and you know maybe there's a plus or minus you got to fill the, the, the money difference a little bit but you know can we work out some kind of oh i love that you know so just getting creative you know I, a lot of times we just assume that the, the seller wants to sell quick and the most amount of money but you know just kind of ask questions and shut up and listen i say because uh you know you know maybe maybe you know my wife's sick i don't want to sell quick i'd love to stay here for a year while you're doing that that works out perfectly for me right unless you ask those questions you don't kind of figure that out right so those are that, that's again i love this stuff too it's, it's uh, all kinds of different it's creative i love creativity what is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Sorry, what's that? What is the quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Don't skip leg day. <laughs> so, you know, I say that as a joke, but it, it, it kind of does say, you know, like, don't just focus on, you know, building one strength. You've kind of got to be multifaceted in this real estate investing game. So, you know, you got to have different hats at different times. So, you, you know, you got to make sure you have some skills or... If you don't have the skills, then then find the partner that does. You know, like I said, I was a lone wolf guy all my career. I, sh I would have benefited more by having an operational partner. So, for example, I love the hunt. I love the, the front part. I love putting it together. I love being creative on the deal, designing all that. You know, it was kind of a down day for me when I got the keys to the apartment building, whatever I was buying, because now I had to execute. And I, know, I don't like the execution part. I would have been better off focusing on this while somebody else did the, the nuts and bolts of the building that was really good at that. So kind of don't skip leg day brings all that into it. You know, if you're, if you find somebody that's strong or you're weak and, and kind of be more well-rounded. So. <laughs> you have any other questions, Kyle? That's good. That's it right now. Uh, just, I'm glad we're in the same space. I, I love land. Daniel loves land, man. And it's just, it, it's awesome. It's awesome. I love that. I love that you like creative finance because that's something we use daily. I mean, we just uh, we just made an offer seven hundred thousand over list price if they give us their terms. So it, it's it's a lot of fun to be able to do that for sellers, you know, and it, it and it surprises them and shows that we're serious as well. Yeah, and you know, I've got another group I'm working with that yeah, the there's like two hundred acres of land, raw land, one house on it. You can sell it today for eight hundred. The seller could sell it for eight fifty. The the pitch to them was it's going to be a three year phased play. Uh, you'll get paid some now, but you know, some after year one, year two, year three, they'll probably end up making about a million four, a million five when it's all done. And that's just so that saves all the cash that the group doesn't have to, you know, lay out all the money yeah. for the, the original piece of dirt. So. Yep. It's, uh, we, we always try and explain that to our sellers. It's like, 
if we raise the money, it's probably going to cost us more. So if you want more money, let's, let's negotiate. I'm, yeah. I'm old school. Let's make, let's make a deal happen. Yeah. And sometimes they say, no, no, I just want my money. Yeah, fair enough. But uh, if, if you can, if you can find that person, what I'm trying to find usually is in my space, you know, the let's find the, the couple in their 60s that have owned the house. Their kids grew up there. They've been in there 20 years. And, and dad knows that he could sell it tomorrow for a good buck, but he's also seen the other developers come in the area and make a profit. And, and he wants some of that. Dad's a little greedy, which is good. Uh, and so, but he doesn't know how, like he's old, he's a little scared. So if you kind of come in and, and, and show them, yeah, like work with me and, you know, we'll see the dream you have, we can kind of flesh that out together. So that's kind of the person you want is that, that person that's, uh, that wants to be a developer, but doesn't know how as well as on the seller part. So. Yeah, we always kind of mention that as well, where it's like, hey, think of us more of a, because when we do those type of, type of JV partnerships where we uh, we bring in the engineering money, you know, we come in, we do all the engineering work, we, we hire the civil engineer, we do all this, think of us just as a partner here. You know, yeah. we're here to teach to you, we're here to show you, show it to you, and we're here to bring the financing for you. Um, because most of the time, and I'm sure you know, they're, they're, sometimes land is pretty liquid, and we have to come in and tap into it and bring that potential to it. And, and, you know, 99 times out of 100, the seller doesn't know any of that, right? Like, they yeah. just kind of, they're interested in, you know, I see the other developers, I want to make a profit, I'd like to do some of that. I don't just want to sell my house or land or whatever for what it's worth. I want a piece of that too. Exactly. Um, so now you can open up their eyes too. And like, wow, I didn't even know half that was possible. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. So uh, where can people find you online? This has been a really good episode. I have each our real estate mentors.com. Yeah, that's a good one. I just Google, you know, my Darcy Marler.com, all lowercase all together. That'll find me. You can go to YouTube and just go Darcy Marler channel. That'll find me as well. I got like 130 videos online that talk just only about this, just development and new construction, land assembly, all this kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a really great resource for, if you want to figure out more about this. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming and helping me on, Kyle. For everybody here, go like, share, subscribe. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Share with a friend. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hey, if you'd like to meet us in person, we do an annual event every year, thehiveislive.com slash summit. We'll see you there. Have a great day.